Hey everybody, this is Ray Telsch, and this is episode 20 of Have Not Seen This, a weekly in-depth look at a much-beloved movie, selected specifically by our guest, that they're a little surprised when they find out people have not seen. Episode 20. Man, that is a milestone, and I know I've said that before, especially on episode 10 when we made it to the double digits, but you don't understand. Episode 20 is a major milestone for me. You see, when I decided I was going to come back to the world of podcasting, I talked to my girlfriend about it, and I said, I'm going to give this a try. And I told her kind of the concept of the show, the idea that I was going to have a guest on. I was going to have them pick the movie, which, as I've said time and time again, is the golden rule. I don't pick the movie. The guest does. And that we would talk about the movie. I told her that I would give this a try and get to episode 20 and then reassess and see where things were. I figured I had enough friends and family that I probably could get 20 episodes in without a big struggle. And boy, was I wrong. It turns out I don't have that many friends, which I kind of already knew, but now I can laugh about it even more. So as you've noticed over the last couple of episodes, I've had a lot of fellow podcasters on. And that's because when I got to around episode 15, I was out of new episodes. I actually really thought the show was going to die at that point and was going to be done. And so I put a call out on a subreddit. Uh, for exchanging guests and ended up with an overwhelming response. Uh, Not only am I not ending things here at episode 20, uh, which was a consideration that I might get to episode 20 and decide this was taking up too much time or I needed to take a break and maybe split things into season, but not only am I not ending things at episode 20, I've got another 10 episodes already either recorded or lined up to record within the next couple of weeks. So the show is going to continue going on. Uh, I am reassessing elements of it. There have been times that I've thought about dropping the pop quiz, and then I've gotten feedback from previous guests who said they really liked it. I thought maybe I'll drop the algorithm says, and I got feedback from a guest who said they really liked it. So I don't think my little closers are going anywhere. Uh, So I am reassessing things, but one of the things I am going to add, starting with this episode, is a little break in the middle of the episode. Now, I'm not selling commercials yet, Uh, not that I necessarily am going to ever, but it would be nice to recoup some of the expenses of doing this podcast, but podcasting has changed so much since I started back in 2006 with the original show back then there were only a handful of shows out there. So when I started my podcast about movies and movie news, there were really only two or three other shows doing that to the point that we kind of waged a little friendly war with another podcast, and I I made a little jab at something that they said in one of our episodes, and by the next week, they had addressed it in their episode. Now, there are so many podcasts out there that if I made a reference to some other podcast on this show, it's most likely they would never get word of it unless I specifically sent them word of it. So there's a lot of podcasts out there, and when you go to the major podcasts, podcast providers, you're seeing a lot of the big names involved with podcasting advertised. You're seeing, you know, Mark Maron or uh, the McElroy brothers or or that kind of stuff. And and not that I have anything against the big podcast names, but it's kind of hard for the little independent podcasts like this show to get noticed. And so I've joined a couple of online communities. And one of the things that we're doing in one of the communities is we're sharing trailers with the other podcasts. So starting with this episode, about halfway through the episode, there'll be a little quick break where I play an ad for another podcast, hopefully one that you might even want to check out based on their trailer in our podcast. And hopefully mine will get played on other podcasts and that will help build up some listeners there as well. So If that bothers somebody, it's going to be like a 30 second or a minute long spot. You can quickly jump over it. It won't be too obtrusive. Uh, I did find a a place for it in this week's show, but I'm not really happy with where it ended up. So it's something I will be assessing in the future. But I think it's an important part of this show is to be a part of the podcasting community. And part of that is appearing on other podcasts. And part of that is helping promote other podcasts and, and having the same thing. That's why I've had a lot of fellow podcasters on as guests, and I've been putting in appearances on others. I talked last week about reappearing on Double Edge, Double Bill. I've talked a couple of times about my 
vocal work on Scared Shirtless. And that's just part of trying to be a part of that community and build my hobby a little bit further. Speaking of community, of course, we're building our own little community here, both on Facebook and Twitter. On Twitter, where I have not seen this. On Facebook, where I have not seen this podcast. And each Friday, I ask a question of our little community. And this time, the Friday inquiry question was, who is one of your favorite character actors? And here are some of our responses. Chris Talent says, my favorite character actor by far is J.K. Simmons, Michigan grown and done everything from Spider-Man's boss to Juno's dad, and even some awesome voice acting. Kat Milner said, Andy Serkis, 100%. Chris Eklund said, oh man, so many. Walton Goggins, Danny Trejo, Ron Perlman, Clancy Brown, Claude Rains, James Cromwell, Peter Stormare. I guess my favorite, though, has to be Peter Laurie. Jason Harris said, two I enjoy a lot are J.T. Walsh and Jeffrey Jones. And Laura Huber said, Stephen Tobolowski, he's in many movies creating memorable characters. He gets the edge because of his podcast, The Tobolowski Files, where he told hysterically funny and poignant stories. Also, we met him when he came to town. Some great character actors mentioned there, some of which I wouldn't even think of character actors like James Cromwell or Andy Serkis. Uh, but I guess they are, especially Serkis, who, uh, you know, I, I just I've gotten so used to seeing or at least seeing his digital work that I don't really think of him as a character actor, but he kind of is the go-to character actor, especially in the world of digital work. And who can possibly argue against J.K. Simmons, as I responded to Chris? Uh, I, I love his voice work, especially in Portal 2. Uh, he's done some great stuff out there. So we'll ask another question this Friday. Please come be a part of our community. Not only join you know my audience as far as listening to the podcast, but, but come talk movies with me. This week, we are looking at a classic Stanley Kubrick film. Uh, from 1971, A Clockwork Orange, and it was picked by Johanna from the Fresh Hell podcast. Their podcast deals with a lot of murder and the macabre. So I found it really interesting that she would pick A Clockwork Orange, a movie that is not particularly female-friendly if you start thinking about the content that's in it. It's a discussion we actually have over the course of our interview. But let's get straight to that. So here we go with A Clockwork Orange from 1971. So I, I got a chance to listen to a, an episode of Fresh Hell oh, this week. Which one? Um, one of your more recent ones. I guess it wasn't the the newest one, but the um, Habsburg. Uh huh. Yeah, the first part, I guess. Yeah, part one. So I've only listened to the one episode, but I I have to ask, how do you in Vienna end up teaming up with somebody? in America for a podcast. <laughs> um, well, Annie and I, we never met in real life. We only know each other from an online game that we play both. And that's how we met. And then we started talking and we realized that we have the same interests in all the horrible and mysterious and macabre thing. And then we decided we should maybe do a podcast together. And that's how it started. <laughs> what game, out of curiosity? I'm not going to tell. <laughs> It's a secret. <laughs> okay. Not even our hardcore fans know about it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So you guys have have not met in real life at no, all? Not yet. We're planning, well, Annie is planning to come over hopefully in November. So that's going to be the first time when we see each other in real life. Well, you guys have a, a great rapport on your podcast. So I that's that's amazing to hear that that's how you guys met. I mean, we talk every day. I think Annie, because Annie is... Um, She's often at home for, for a couple of weeks at a time because she has uh, health issues and she just had a surgery. So I think at times I'm just the only person she has constant contact with, except for her family. And I don't know. It's just, it, it turned out well, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed listening to it and uh, I hope to listen to some more in oh, the that's future. that's great. <laughs> we always like to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> So forgive my ignorance, uh, not really familiar with Austria. What is the world of cinema like there? What is a movie going experience like for you over there? Um, do you want to hear about Austrian movies or the movie going experience uh, in general? I guess in general. In general. Um, I don't think it's that much different to the US. I mean, I've only been to a US cinema once. But it's pretty much the same. It's like the only thing that's different here is that you have to pick your, your seat number in advance. It's not like going in and not knowing where you're going to end up sitting. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, that's become quite normal here. In fact, I, a couple of years ago, I worked at a movie theater that kind of started that in my area. And now all movie theaters seem to do that. When I went to see the latest Star Wars movie at a theater I've gone to for decades, they now have you pick your seat number in advance as well. Do you prefer that? Um, You know, I don't know. With the theater I worked at, it made sense because there were a lot of other elements to it like they served food in the theater so mm -hmm. you kind of needed to know if when you went up to the counter you needed to know where your seats were so they knew where to bring it to i, I tend to sit in the same seats in the theater i do know, in the too. same area <laughs> but i also kind of like to go in and kind of sum up you know if there's a large crowd in that area i may move a couple rows back yeah. or if you know so i I am I'm, I'm kind of of both minds. I like it at times and at times I don't I don't care for it and, and I'll just move seats if I need to. <laughs> well here we are very strict, you know, it's like the Austrian German mentality of having strict rules and following the strict rules like you you pick your seats, you stick with it. <laughs> Uh, Austrians being strict? I, I never would have gathered that. <laughs> well it's it not as strict as Germans, but yeah, we do like rules. But we also gotcha. are like this kind of people who are like um know how to get around them if it's necessary. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Now, when you see movies, whether it's at home or in the theater, are they, are you seeing the American language version or the English language version yeah. of them? Or are you seeing them in German? No, always um, the, the original version. I started it. I used to live in Mexico for a while. And there you pretty much have only the, the original version in English. And I don't know, I got used to it and now I just can't with the the German dubbed. It's horrible, really. And the, uh, like in the, in the, up until the 90s, I think they had really great voice actors, like really trained voice actors. And nowadays it all sounds really cheap, like they don't put a lot of money into that anymore. So I don't even bother with it. Plus, I think it takes away a lot from movies if you don't hear the original sound. You know what I mean? Yeah, and the reason I asked was because that actually came up when I was researching this movie that Stanley Kubrick was so impressed by the German language version. Yes, that's he true. Actually, he actually commended the actor and felt like he brought more to the character than Malcolm McDowell's original audio. Uh, yeah, and th that's true. And he also wanted to have him especially for uh, Jack Nicholson in The Shining. Right, right. He went on to do quite a few other Kubrick projects after this. So so we're talking this week about A Clockwork Orange from 1971, written and directed by Stanley Kubrick, based on the novel by Anthony Burgess, starring Malcolm McDowell, Patrick McGee, Warren Clark, Carl During, Anthony Sharp, Sheila Rayner, and Clive Francis. <laughs> I always start with, how do you describe this movie to someone who has not seen it? Like, how do you sell them on the idea of seeing this movie? <laughs> how do I sell them on the idea? Well, I would say it's a movie that has um, three parts. Like, the first part is the very violent one. Um, I think that's the part that m many people um, think the whole movie is about. But then it turns into something like a very dark comedy kind of thing. Um It's a, it's a satire. It's critical. It's how would I say that? It's it criticizes our society, even if it was filmed in 1971. And I don't even remember when the book was written. Uh, it's a long time ago that I read it, but it's still very very modern. It has modern ideas, I think. Yeah, and surprisingly relevant to today's yes. world. You know, even though it's you know 40 years later. So out of all the movies that are out there, why was this your choice for the show? I started movie science for a couple of years, so I'm really into movies. And then people, when they hear it, they always ask me, what's your favorite movie? And I always tend to say, I don't have a favorite movie because it's just not possible. I think it always depends on your mood. Um, sometimes it's it's the one and then sometimes you can't even stand that one and you go and pick another one as the one you need to watch. But there are movies that you always go back to. And for me, it's definitely... A Clockwork Orange. Like, I love all Kubrick movies, but this is um, the one I love the most. I, I think that's a great answer to what's your favorite movie. That's a question I, I absolutely hate yeah. because <laughs> there's just so many movies out there. How do you pick it's one impossible. that is your all-time favorite? Yeah. 
Um, so out of all the Kubrick movies, you th- this is your favorite of his? Yes. I love the aesthetics. I love the style. I love the music. I mean, he always have these great soundtracks and his one point perspective and, and everything. But I don't know. It's um, it's per- For me, it's a perfect movie. It is. I have to admit, I was really surprised by you choosing this because I wouldn't think, um, I, I guess to be almost closed minded here, I would not think a woman would care much for this movie given the treatment of women within the film. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I know a lot of women who enjoy the movie because of, as you say, of all the the sexual violence that is going on. And um, I mean, that's in a lot of Kubrick movies, actually, if you think about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He definitely liked breasts. <laughs> yeah, there's – I was – again, while I was researching this, there was a, a bit of trivia that there was some actress that, you know – she was auditioning topless for it and he kept doing having her do the thing over and over again and she didn't mind it because Kubrick of course was famous for you know numerous takes and when she left the audition her friend said he just she she was pretty sure he just liked seeing her topless oh, definitely, just looking yeah. at her breasts yeah <laughs> i'm sure about that so i i guess my question then would be as a woman how do you how do you rise above that stance? Because as we just said, it probably is not very popular with many women because of that depiction uh, and because of the violence. How do you as a woman rise above that to, to appreciate this film? That's a very interesting question. I think I know a lot of people who always think that they can just um, like movies that they can somehow identify with or that they have some sympathy for the characters in there. And in that movie, there is not really any person in there that you can have sympathy with yeah or parts where you say okay that was a good thing or or the right thing to do i think i just i take movies mostly mostly for the visual art that they are and i don't think that the movie glorifies any violence against women on the contrary i don't know i never thought there is any problem with me enjoying that movie and having that point of view Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm certainly not saying it's a problem. I'm just no, no. curious as to to your mentality. No, it's just really interesting, yeah, because I never thought about that I shouldn't or that I never thought about why other women might not enjoy that movie. I can see it if you're like a survivor of sexual violence or any violence against you, then that definitely is problematic. But in general, I just take the movie for what it is, I guess. Yeah. Well, you definitely isolated one of the issues I have with this movie, uh, as I discussed in another recent episode of this podcast. I I want a movie with somebody that I can rally behind. Mm. Um, and, and Alex is a very complicated protagonist because he's not a moral character in any way. He's He's a murderer, although that was unintentional, but he's violent. He's a rapist. He's he's just an unpleasant character. So it's hard to get behind him. It's hard to cheer for him, even in, as he's being reconditioned and supposedly being made a better person, even that is kind of a horrific act. So it's, there's not really somebody in this movie to, to rally behind. No, there's not one person. I think Kubrick himself said that the, the prison chaplain was the one moral character, but I don't even see that really. I don't, I don't feel that's, that's the moral character in that movie. I think every character in this movie is kind of not pleasant. Yeah. And the, the chaplain, I would, it's not ever anything that's done by his character, but Alex says in his narration that he thinks the, the mm-hmm. chaplain likes him because he's young, yeah. which, implies that he has some sort of, I guess, pedophile tendencies almost. He, he and it, it's not shown right, yeah. on screen, but... Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I t- taking a look at the critical response to this, uh, it sits at an 87% at Rotten Tomatoes, which is pretty positive, 93% audience score, 80% at Metacritic, which again is pretty positive. Uh, it was n- named number two in Entertainment Weekly's controversial films list in 2006, and it sits at number 50 on the AFI's top 100 list. Uh, I always go to Roger Ebert first <laughs> for a film review, 
And he brought the negative this time and said, Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange is an ideological mess, a paranoid right-wing fantasy masquerading as an Orwellian warning. It pretends to oppose the police state and forced mind control, but all it really does is celebrate the nastiness of its hero, Alex. Alex is violent because it is necessary for him to be violent in order for this movie to entertain in the way Kubrick intends. Alex has been made into a sadistic rapist, not by society, not by his parents, not by the police state, not by centralization, and not by creeping fascism, but by the producer, director, and writer of this film, Stanley Kubrick. Directors sometimes get sanctimonious and talk about their creations in the third person as if society had really created Alex, but this makes their direction into sort of a cinematic, automatic writing. No, I think Kubrick is being too modest. Alex is all his. On the flip side, Vincent Canby of the New York Times wrote, it seems to me that by describing horror with such elegance and beauty, Kubrick has created a very disorienting but human comedy, not warm and lovable, but a terrible sum up of where the world is at. With all of man's potential for divinity through love, through his art and his music, this is what has sometimes boiled down to a civil population terrorized by hoodlums, disconnected porno art, quick solutions to social problems with the only hope for the future in the vicious Alex. So any thoughts on those? Um, well, first of all, I think that I know that people always want to have a reason why people are like this. And I mean, our podcast is about horrible things done by often very horrible people. And there are some people that just don't have any other reason than the simple fact that they enjoy it. Like there are people, there is no family to blame, no society to blame. And I think Alex is one of those people. Like he's daydreaming that he has, he simply just, ex he enjoys the, the violent acts. As to the thing that it's Kubrick's, that Kubrick made him just simply violent because just for us to enjoy. I think the book is way, way more horrible than the movie in some ways, don't you think? I have not read the book, and Ebert actually does address that in his review as well, saying that he knows it's you know very faithful to the book in its adaptation, but he argues that Kubrick made it visual as opposed to something that exists in the mind's eye. Well, that's true, yeah. Well, the book, um, <laughs> in the book, the the girls, for example, that get raped are described as ten year olds. Um, Alex is 15 in the book, I think, while in the movie he's 17. But other than that, yeah, I think that's Kubrick's most true to his source material movie ever. Like, Yeah, that's what I've read. Yeah, that they sometimes didn't even take the script out, but just uh, used the book, the novel itself. Yeah, which I, I can appreciate that because like, that's my, that's my argument about Kubrick's uh, Shining, which I, I enjoy The Shining, but it's not the shining it's you not know, I, I love I, I love stephen king's novel yeah. and i and i appreciate kubrick's movie but they're two very different stories yeah. telling different themes i think definitely definitely uh stephen king hated the kubrick version as much as far as i know like that's why he yeah. made this um, mini series tv series the shining which I liked as a more faithful adaptation of the book. I mean, it still had problems, but but I liked that. Yeah, I couldn't go. Well, I'm not the biggest fan of of the book itself. I'm not behind this this labyrinth, um, bush animals kind of things. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that took now, me so much out. It's hmm. now your your podcast does touch on the macabre quite often. Are you a fan of horror? I am. Yes, um, but. I think there are not a lot of good horror movies out there lately. Gotcha. Okay. You think? All right. Well, let's get back on to. Do I, well, I yeah. I mean, I I I think there are some good ones. I before I did this, uh, I did a brief stint on a horror podcast where we reviewed every week. We reviewed two or three horror movies, usually independent films, and there was a lot of garbage mixed in. So. Yeah, I'd agree with you. There's there's not a lot of good horror movies. There are some. Hereditary but... was one where I say that was really... I like the ones that build up tension, like The Shining, where it's the tension is... Like, they don't show horrible things, but, you know, you get all in your seat and stiff and your heart goes for no reason at all, but just because the tension of the movie builds up. I enjoy these kind of horror movies more than the gore and very graphic ones because, meh, you know, after a while you've seen it all. 
Yeah, and with Hereditary, it was almost the concepts of what was going on more than the execution on screen. Yeah. Uh, although it certainly has a couple of what the hell was that yes, type moments on definitely. screen. <laughs> that, <laughs> I, I don't think I'll ever experience those kinds of things again. <laughs> the, the decapitation in particular yes, is still exactly. disturbs that is me. It's the, the absolute moment that I was thinking of right now. But because you're like, did that really just happen or was he just high or... Yeah. So uh, so I guess the question, going back to what we've been discussing, is do you like Alex? Do you, do you find anything redeeming about him, or is he a, a problematic character for us to have as, he, as our protagonist and narrator? He's absolutely problematic, but he has one, one thing I like about him, and that is, his love, his, that is his love of music. Because he, like me, loves Beethoven. He's my favorite, too, in classical movie, music, and that's the only... I wouldn't even call it redeeming because that's not a redeeming quality, but it's the kind of thing that makes him human for me, mm -hmm. that he loves something so much that it pains him when he has to sacrifice it. Yeah. And you mentioned a minute ago about him, there not being really a rationalization behind his bad behavior. Um, I mean, we do see... His home life, which seems pretty normal, yeah. you know, he has his, he has both of his parents. He has, a, a, I guess, in their, in their time and setting a nice apartment or house, um, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be any problem there that would have created this behavior in him. And he's the educated one. If you compare him to his three other friends, he's the one who he's definitely the more educated one. He he talks different than the other ones. He enjoys different things. He's their leader. I think he's even the worst of them all because the others are just like, they just run after him and they do whatever he says up until the moment they don't want to do what he tells them to do, but we know how that ends. So, Which I was just going to say is, you know, they, they do attempt a little uprising against him. And I think that supports what you said about him being the worst is when they want to rise up against him, it's just words. Yeah. And he retaliates with physicality against them. He's willing to hurt his own friends, whereas they weren't willing to go that direction. No, they just wanted to be more, they wanted to have more influence, let's say it like this, like not only him having the power over them. I think that was the right. moment that broke the, the whole... Um, dynamics in that group was when they were in the milk bar and the lady was singing and and he shuts dim up exactly dim is yeah. making the harsh comments yeah and he he smashes him with his uh cane there yeah yeah i think that was the, the moment that we saw where the group kind of broke right because when they go home after that that next evening they come around his uh apartment and are waiting for him when he leaves and that's when you have the confrontation so yeah that that one moment interestingly enough a moment created because of of music, because of yeah. his love of music is what ends up fragmenting them. Yeah, and also the music is the one thing that gives him the, I, I don't know, the courage. I don't want to call it courage, but when they are walking at the marina and he says he a window was open and he heard music and that's made him act. Yeah, outside he was calm, but inside he yeah. was kind of roiling until he kind of tuned in on that music. Yeah, that's a good point. So I, I think a lot of people know A Clockwork Orange. You know, we have that opening iconic shot of Alex sitting there just staring straight at the camera with his false lashes on the, the one eye and the, the bowler hat. Um, you have, of course, the, the Ludovico method where they have his eyes mm. uh, forced open for his rehabilitation. But I don't know that a lot of people have seen this movie. It, it, it runs over two hours long. Do you feel feel like people know enough about this movie that they get it no. or do they you think it's just what's in pop culture and they're yeah. kind of missing the point i think they're missing the point i think uh, most people think that's just a violent film and that's it and as you say they just know this icon ic iconic shots like they know his eyelashes they know his white clothes like i see often uh on halloween people dress up like him with his friends but I don't think they really know the depth of the movie, which, as I say, I think it's a it's a comedy in 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 a way. Like the the end is very funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I searched uh, for this on Amazon, the, I found it interesting. The top result when I searched for it wasn't the movie, wasn't even the book. It was hats. 
Really? I would have guessed yeah. posters. Like I see a lot of posters always that are sold. Yeah, and it does have that iconic image on the poster of, yeah. of Alex as well. But yeah, so what do you think – and maybe I shouldn't jump to this ahead, so far ahead, but what do you think the point of this movie is? What, do you, what message do you think Kubrick and Burgess are trying to say with this story? Because I'm a little up in the air about it. Yeah, it's difficult. Maybe it really is the question if, if people don't have the choice to do good and are kind of forced to do good, is it then really good? But that would give it kind of a too moral meaning that maybe is not even there. Maybe it really is just for entertainment. I don't know. Yeah, and that line is said later on after his rehabilitation that what they've done is taken away his choice. He's yeah. not choosing to be good. He's not choosing to be bad anymore. But hes they've taken away his choice entirely. And so you kind of feel like that's potentially a message of the movie. If there is a message, then I guess that would be the message, yeah. Okay. See, I was going with more of a, you know, he, he gets his rehabilitation and he goes back out in the world and his parents have moved on. They don't want him around anymore. His friends, the Droogs, have now become police officers and they beat him up. He ends up at the home of the, the writer that he assaulted early on in the film. And all of them are familiar with his case because it's been the headline in the newspapers. But none of them are willing to give him the chance to be a better person. So I almost was going with the idea that society never forgets or, or society dictates who you are more than you do after, after a certain period of time. I think that's definitely true in society. Like people who, I don't know, I guess it's the same in the States, but here if you, if you come out of prison and Austria has a, has a prison system that is built on rehabilitation like that is a very important part of it and still you're always gonna be that person that was in prison like people don't forget that is definitely true but also i don't know if you would be his parents or the writer why would you why would you give him a chance if you know that what he did was just pure enjoyment yeah i mean i guess that's two separate questions though i mean i, I would think his parents would ideally his parents would want him to improve, would want to welcome him back with open arms, would, would want to know that he's a better person. That's what I would think ideally. I know that if, you know, this happened with my son, um, well, I, you know what? I, I don't know. That would be a, a I, I, could, I can talk all I want right now, but until it actually happens, which hopefully it never does, um, I, I don't know how I'd react in that situation. I'm, I'm a little bit lost on his parents, though. Like, I know that his parents, um, they were even scared of him, or they, it, it appears they are scared of him when he comes back home, uh, and they have moved on with their kind of surrogate son, uh, Joe the Lodger. And right. then when he's in, in the hospital after his attempted suicide, then they come and then they are like opening their arms again after he's back to his old self which they might not know. But still, I'm, I'm, I'm so lost on, on the parents, actually. I don't know where to put them. Yeah, they they almost remind me of um, Kubrick's previous movie, 2001, in that, you know, I mean, that movie, he really drains humanity from humans. Mm -hmm. And I almost feel like the parents would be better served in that movie. It's almost as if their humanity is absent. I mean, all along, they're not exactly the most attached parents at the beginning when, when they try to wake him up to go to school yeah. and he lies about having a stomachache. They don't really seem concerned or attached then either. I mean, we don't know how long they have tried beforehand already. Like, there must have been so much going on in that family with him. Like, if it's every day like this, that he doesn't want to go to school and they just gave up on him, I guess. I mean, he yeah. has Mr. Deltoid, so... Yeah, who... Boy, that is an interesting character mm -hmm. uh, who I never remember, but his... Especially his speech pattern... Yeah. Is really... It's almost foppish, and yet there's a a severity to it, like a, an underlying threat to it at the same time, which is an interesting way to present a character. And bitter. He's very bitter, I think. Yeah. Do you, do you think he had given up on Alex as well? I honestly don't think that he had given up on him initially because he went there and he had this whole speech and, and tried again to scare him into behaving correctly. But I think then, obviously, after the murder, that was it. I mean, it's the end of the line there. That's what he said. Yeah. Maybe he was glad of having, you know, not to deal with him anymore, that he's rid of him now. Well, I mean, he even spits on him there at yeah. the police station. So, yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. His parents, so that if his parents have already given up on him by the beginning of the movie, then it would make sense that they would move on after his he's been you know put in prison. As far as the writer goes, no, I would I would never as as soon as the writer identifies him, it makes sense yeah. that he is out for revenge. And I, other than just moving the plot along, I cannot think of a single reason why Alex, who tells us in the narration how lucky he is that the writer doesn't recognize him. And then he goes and sings Singing in the yeah. Rain in the bathtub. <laughs> like, that's the dumbest move ever. And there's no real justification for it other than to move the story along. Maybe that was his happy song that he that he went to subconsciously. Like he's <laughs> relaxed in the bathtub and mm, that's what comes to his head. But I agree. I always thought that's very stupid of him. But it's also a good thing. I mean, the poor writer. I mean, I, f I feel really bad for the writer guy. Yeah. It's a very, very tragic character. In the end, he even gets put away because he wants Alex dead and the prime minister and his whole politics are like saying he's a crazy person and... I don't remember exactly what the words were, but you know that in the end, the prime minister tells Alex that this kind of writer had it out for him and he wanted to have him killed and stuff like that. Yeah, because the, at that point in the film, in the third act of the film, oddly enough, you know, we've watched Alex as a criminal and we've watched him go through this rehabilitation. But in the third act, it, he's a political pawn. Yeah. The writer and his friends want to use him to show the government in a bad light. And the, the writer is kind of split between this wanting to use Alex as a political pawn, but also get his revenge yeah. for his wife. And it's even what the prime minister is doing in that last scene is he's just moving the pawn to his side of the board. I love that last scene. I think it's it's hilarious. I love how Malcolm Adal plays it. Um, the <laughs> prime minister feeds him. And when he like snuggles up to him on the shoulder with the uh, photographers, it's uh, it's the best scene. <laughs> It is it is very creepy. And that comes on the heels, of course, of the, the previous scene where he had been with the psychiatrist and, you know, she's testing him with those slides. And it, it doesn't take a very deep look at that scene to see that what that's done is shown us his violent tendencies have returned because every single one of those slides he's responding to with some sort of violent quip. And he enjoys it. And he's so happy that he has it back. Yeah. Smashing the eggs and... Yeah, yeah. It's a little disconcerting that you've seen, okay, his violent tendencies are back, and now here he is popping open his mouth to be fed like a baby bird and snuggling up against yeah. the prime minister, when you know that if, if his hands were out of those casts, he probably would be looking for a place to put a knife. Yeah. It's it's a little disturbing. <laughs> it is disturbing, but that's also the comedy or the, or the humor in it, don't you think? Like, it's, it's oh, yeah. too, too, too close to reality. So the only thing that is left is to laugh maybe about it because otherwise. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's hard to, I, I think it's hard to find the comedy in it because you are looking at this from such a place of horror from the first third of the movie. Yeah. You know, you have all this violence going on in the first third of the movie. And then when you get to the, the third part, it, you're right. It does become kind of a black comedy slash satire, but I don't know that the audience is necessarily in the mood for it by the time it gets to that point of the movie. I agree, yeah. yeah. Which, which makes it a challenging view for a lot of people. Remember the first time you held a controller? That first cartridge you blew into so you could get that stinking game to work? What about your first comic you read? The first time you saw Star Wars, years and years and years ago. Now you're an adult, working full time to provide for you and your family. But even after all of your hard work, you still make it your quest to spend time with your kids, hoping they find even the slightest interest in some of the things that you had grown up loving. Video games, movies, comics, My Little Ponies. Join me, Kyle Fetterline, every Wednesday morning on my quest as I discuss with guests what it's like to raise a kid and watch them take after some of our own interests as kids, or have no interest at all in the things that we had grown up loving. This is Parent Quest. Head on over to Anchor and ask me your questions, leave me a voice message, and follow me on Twitter at ParentQuestPod, Instagram and Facebook at ParentQuest. Thank you. 
So I, I guess let me ask you about the middle part. We talked a little bit about the first third, a little part about the third. You know, the middle part is his time in prison and then his treatment, treatment the Ludovico yeah. method, which is, you know, having his eyes jammed open and having to watch these films, uh, which along with the serum that he's been given is causing him to have this this sick reaction to to violence. The case could be made that this kind of mirrors conversion therapy that we see today mm -hmm. for you know people who are who are gay and their parents try to put them through some sort of religious uh conversion therapy any thoughts on that i think the whole ludovico treatment um is a very, that's a very disturbing scene or very disturbing thought for me like it has this kind of almost brainwashing mentality where it um makes you revolt or your body revolt against things that you usually enjoy, which, okay, for Alex, it's violence. But as you say, it is comparable to the pray away the gay movement. And, and uh, um, I don't even know where else is it used. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but with as much but yeah, success, you know, I mean, that's, that's, I, I almost would say that this movie shows that those kinds of movements don't really succeed. They're not going to, because, they're trying to remove something from Alex that is in his very nature. Well, I mean, they succeeded, but it left him. It left him as the victim, which I I don't know. I never feel sorry for him. Do you, in that uh, second part, feel sorry for him or feel bad for him in a way? No, because because of the way that sequence works. You know, he comes home, and his parents don't want him, and then he gets beaten up by the homeless, and then he gets beaten up by the drugs and. There's never anything that he does except for when the beggar comes up to him and asks him if he could spare some copper. And in the, Yeah, he wanted to give him some yeah, yeah, that's true. In the beginning of the movie, he he has this tirade about how he hates these kinds of people. And at, when that happens towards the end of the movie, he just goes into his pocket and pulls out some coins. But then again, he also tried to be violent already before with uh, Joe. Yes, true. But I think I think that's the one sympathetic moment you get is that he's approached by the beggar. He does give him coins, but then his past is still catching up with him. Other than that, no, I don't I don't feel sorry for Alex in his situation. I don't I don't know that it's possible to, but that'd be an interesting question no. to pose. I don't think you can feel bad for him because of all the things that you know that he did. Well, and, and again, they set him up, him and his friends as such reprehensible characters you know, that like I noticed, okay. So you have the, I guess they call it the, the orgy scene, but you have that, that quick speed sex scene, right? Yeah, that uh, 28 minute right. or something like this one take. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it's the only scene in the movie of consensual sex and it's sped through because it's unimportant. Yeah. As opposed to like the Billy boys thugs trying to rape the woman, which goes on on screen for what feels like an eternity. Yeah. And then like when the droogs come home from their or come back to the bar for their after their antics, uh one of the droogs apologizes to the naked statue that's, you know, dealing out the milk. He apologizes to a statue but has just done rape. Yeah, and he also calls it um that they had a lot of work or that they had a busy night or something like this just like he came home from office. Yeah. So, I mean, it's yeah. it's this weird contrast to what you'd expect that really kind of sets Alex and his friends up in just a negative light. I mean, there just there really is nothing redemptive about them, which, as I said, makes this a hard movie for me to to get behind. I mean, it's a brilliant film. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But it's hard to connect with, which maybe is a good thing. I think if you would connect with this movie, it would be worrying <laughs> in a way if you understand alex and why he does uh, there is no understanding of it he just enjoys it and that's all there is as you said he has a normal home he has a normal upbringing i mean he doesn't live in the best living area but i think that's that's just the time he lives in he just loves it yeah you know, this movie is filled with iconic visuals and, and I mean, it's very much in Kubrick's signature style. What is one of your favorite visuals from the movie? When he comes home and um, he listens to Beethoven with the, the Jesus statues and he sits and he takes off his boots, 
which is often misinterpreted by people. They often think he's masturbating to Beethoven's music. Um, and how I, what I love about Kubrick is his shots of the face, mm -hmm. like the Kubrick stare that he always does in his movies. And that's one of the scenes I like the most. Yeah, I referred to that as almost the Jesus kick line because of the way that the <laughs> statues are set up. <laughs> they are so expensive, by the way. I don't know if you if you ever check those art pieces that they have in the whole movie. Uh -huh. The Jesus statues are very expensive. Really? I looked them up. Yeah. That's interesting. It's called Christ Unlimited. And I think two of those were like $2,900 or something like this. Oh, my goodness. And you need two pairs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the art that fills the movie, it's all very erotic, which... Yeah, it's naughty, naughty, naughty. <laughs> <laughs> which almost could be made the argument that, that that is the world and therefore Alex's obsession with, with sex and rape makes sense if the world is focused in that way. I still don't think it justifies it, but it's it's very interesting. Like the health, the, uh, the health farm, you know, mm -hmm. you have the, the giant... Well, you have art everywhere of naked women and, you know, spreading their legs. And you have the giant statue of the penis that he beats the woman with. And I mean, it's – but it's everywhere. It's very pervasive. It's everywhere, yeah. And it's so it's the world. It's not just Alex's world. It is the world as a whole. Yeah. I mean, they even say in the beginning the, the homeless person who they beat up – when he says he they can kill him because he doesn't want to live in this fil in this filthy world or in this world anymore so i think the whole society is very very brutal very very without morals maybe yeah maybe that's also an explanation for his parents and their behavior like this disconnected relationship they have with their own son yeah, and I mean, and he does say that it is a world without law or order. Um, the, the his stinking world speech. Yeah, you know, so it it does kind of imply that maybe what Alex and his friends are doing at night is pretty typical of what anybody is doing there. Yeah. By the way, you know, it's I always find it hilarious when futuristic visions of movies are end up being predictive. But who would have thought? Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange would predict the wild hair colors that people tend to use all the time now. You know, you see his True, mom yeah. wearing blue hair yeah. in one scene and it was another color in another scene. And it's like... I was the waitress in the in the pub where they went to. Yeah. And the psychiatrist had blue hair. And it's like, that's yeah. that's very common. You go out in public nowadays, you're going to see people with those colors hair and it's, it's normal. <laughs> but he didn't predict the... Uh the uh, way of listening to music that we have now. <laughs> no, I'm they're... always laughing about the scene with the mini tapes. <laughs> yeah, the mini tapes. And he's at a vinyl record store. Yeah, 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 true. With the uh, prevalent 2001 soundtrack on the front of the desk there. Uh, yeah, and something else, I think Pink Floyd. But Pink Floyd didn't want to be part of the soundtrack or there was something like this, but he showed the cover of the of one of the Pink Floyd albums. I don't remember which one. Yeah. Well, and that doesn't surprise me that they'd want to, they, they, they don't want to be very commercial. So that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, what else do you want to talk about about this? Um, the music. What do you think about the music? I, the music is, you know, it's interesting. The music was my introduction to this movie. Long before I ever sat down and watched the film, I had heard the soundtrack easily a dozen times because I had a friend growing up who had the soundtrack and loved it. So mm -hmm. to me, it's almost weird seeing the music on, you know, with the images that are going on on screen. I'm so used to it being disconnected from the visuals. It, it's a wonderful soundtrack. It's a, it's a great soundtrack, but it's also so, it's a weird soundtrack. And it's a little bit untypical, I think, for Kubrick. And I also think that the Pink Floyd would have been not typical Kubrick movie because he's always very classical yeah M music uh, oriented yeah so it's so it's a little weird for him to have these synthesized renditions synthesized, of yeah. classic music but i love them i think they are great and they work in the movie so well yeah like the scene in the in the in the record store when he's walking with his very old fashioned outfit <laughs> and then the synthesized um beethoven it's perfect yeah and it, so it it kind of crosses the gap between his love for classic music and this futuristic world that it's supposed to be set in 
you know, because it does then kind of play as almost a fu- futuristic rendition of that music. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that Beethoven doesn't dominate the soundtrack, though, that it's more Rossini than... It's Rossini, yeah. yeah. It's weird, right? <laughs> and I, I, I wonder how intentional a part that is on Kubrick, which it's got to be because he, he did that. I mean, that's his choices of music were very intentional. I think all of his choices were always very intentional. Like he's Kubrick, he's the perfectionist, you know what I mean? He's like, they have theories about The Shining if that's just like um, a mistake he made with some chair over there and in the next scene he's over there or if he did it on purpose, which I think he did make mistakes in his movies. But music definitely was his choice. Oh yeah, absolutely. But what does he want to say with it? (sighs) You got me there. (laughs) <laughs> because I don't know. I don't know. Because actually, I never um, paid attention that it's mostly Rossini. I think I read it like a couple of months ago in an article. And then I paid attention to it before. It's just like you connect. The Clockwork Orange is Beethoven. Yeah. I mean, that's what everybody associates with the movie is is yeah. Beethoven. Because that's what his specific love is. Yeah. And I guess that's supposed to be the tragedy when he can't listen to the Ninth Symphony anymore. Although there are other Beethoven symphonies that he, you know, could could probably learn to appreciate. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, he could try some Mozart as an Austrian, I have. Him. Well, yeah, Mozart would be a good choice. And it's very, you know, it makes you a little bit maybe less aggressive and more happy yeah. to listen to Mozart. Or Wagner. Wagner would have been good for Alex. So why Beethoven? I mean, again, we never understand what Alex's fixation with Beethoven is in the first place. You know, where he, why he differs from his friends with that appreciation of that music. We never get a, a justification for that. But yeah, why Beethoven instead of Wagner or uh, or Mozart? That's a great question. Did you know that um, Beethoven at his time was considered to be very obscene and um, that women shouldn't listen to it, for example? And very, it was very sexualized, his music. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. No. Well, maybe that's why then. I had no idea. Maybe that's one of the reasons, yeah. I knew that Mozart himself could be a little bawdy, uh, which, yep. is, which is why it would make <laughs> sense for him to appreciate Mozart. But uh, no, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Plus, it's also very dramatic music. While Mozart is very... Mozart is so complex, but he makes it sound easy and lighthearted, while Beethoven is so heavy and so dramatic, and it fits way better to Alex than than Mozart ever would. But I think Wagner would work well. But yeah, Beethoven was considered to be very obscene. And he ruined a lot of um, pianos while playing because they were not, like, constructed (laughs) for his kind of heavy playing. I read that somewhere. I don't know how true it is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, you're supposed to believe everything you read on the internet anyway, so, you know. Everything. <laughs> yeah, everything. So I mentioned earlier, you know, people probably know a couple of moments out of the movie, but it's actually quite long, uh, a little over two hours. Do you feel like it's too long of a movie? I always I, – I never paid attention that it's over two hours. I know that it's two hours, but it never feels like that for me. I always feel like it's 90 minutes movie. I think it's still- I feel like there's some parts that could have been trimmed, but of course, with it being Kubrick, I then wonder why they were left in. So like when he's getting enlisted or checked in or, or whatever at the, at the prison, you know, that, that scene is really long of him, you know, having to turn in his possessions and change clothes. And it's like, well, why is this all here? And the same thing when he's being turned over to the clinic to undergo the treatment, there's like a minute and a half of signatures and paperwork. Yeah. And it's to show the bureaucracy of all this that's going on, maybe. Yeah. That's what I actually wrote down was, you know, that that it's showing the pervasiveness of the bureaucracy. And I guess that's just that's not something we would see in a contemporary film. Except for the Blues Brothers. I mean, if you want to call that contemporary. Yeah. But like the scene when the Blues Brothers, when... um when he can leave prison in the beginning, it's also like signing and here's your stuff and here's that. And yeah, I mean, I think a movie today for the most part would just be like, you're getting out and then cue, you know, cut to outside walking outside, away. Outside prison. Yeah. <laughs> so the movie originally was a four hour cut. So there's a lot of scenes <laughs> that he already cut and he had all of that destroyed. So he told his assistant that all of that that's cut out of the movie has to be gone forever typical Kubrick. Which I, I almost appreciate because I, I feel yeah. like we, especially with a, a, an auteur like Kubrick who's passed away, you know, I think 
there would if the studio came across that they would be persuaded to release oh it's the extended yeah. director's cut four hour director's version cut. who wants to mm-hmm. see that you know it's it's like let's appreciate the art that was released i i am always torn you know when when somebody picks a movie that has a director's cut do i watch the theatrical release or do i watch the director's cut and i'll usually research to see which version the director actually stands behind exactly yeah yeah and a lot of time that that director's cut is just the studio grabbing more money when the stu- the yeah. director is very happy with the product that was released so yeah i think it's a it's it was a good decision and it fits his character or what i think his character was very well this uh, perfectionist who wants to have control over everything like i read somewhere on set he even controlled what kind of soap or or shampoo there was for the actors and things like this so oh yeah and i mean he's notorious for numerous takes on something that you know something very simple might get you know 30 40 takes before he's happy with what they did so it frustrated a lot of actors Uh, shelley duval in the shining um, she lost hair because she was so stressed out with him. Oh, yeah. The scene um, where the guy who went on to play Darth Vader, I always forget his name, David. David You Prowse. know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And he has to carry the wheelchair downstairs with Mr. Alexander in it. And he told Kubrick beforehand that um, that he's not known as one-shot Kubrick and <laughs> that he, he uh, doesn't... He th- doesn't think he's going to be capable to do a lot of shots and that he should get it over with. And I think they just did six shots of this scene, which was very exhausting, apparently. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move to the algorithm says this is kind of a uh, lightning round of other movies that va- various algorithms say you might like if you like this one. So this is kind of quick responses. What do you think of these movies? Have you seen them? Have you not seen them? Uh, do you not understand why they would be associated with a clockwork orange? That kind of thing. Okay. All right. Uh, full metal jacket. Love it. Yeah. I actually think I like I it more it. than this one. I love the end scene. See, I'm the other way. I like the the first half of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like the first half, but I think the end scene when they start singing uh-huh. the, the children's song, it's, I love that part. Yeah. But yeah, other than that, I think the first part, the, the whole... Um, uh, training part is the better one. Yeah. I agree. Taxi driver. Uh, I, yeah. Classic, classic movie that you should have seen. And I like it very much. It's not one of my favorites, but I really do appreciate it. All right. Uh, reservoir dogs. Love it. I love <laughs> it. I think it's one of Tarantino's best. I do too. And I, I, I've always described it as rather Shakespearean in the way the story is set up. Uh, and, yeah. and I almost feel like that's how it's connected to this movie, because there's a lot of Shakespearean elements to A Clockwork Orange, especially with the language. It's uh, it, it has a very theatrical feeling to it, Clockwork Orange. Um, I always have the feeling when he comes downstairs, when the drooks are waiting for him downstairs, the music, how it slows down, mm-hmm. is, feels a little bit like um, the transition in theater scenes. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, very sad movie. Made me cry a lot. Oh, yeah? Yeah. The end when... Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, made me cry. <laughs> I don't even I don't even know why. I guess the connection would be the, the institutionalization of things between the two movies. Yeah. Although how they, how they treat Jack Nicholson, his treatment that he gets. Where... Yeah, which is very similar yeah. to the Ludovico technique used here. Yeah. Uh, American Psycho. Uh, I think the connection is that, um, he also enjoys violence and killing people just for the sake of it and without any real reason, other than somebody having a better uh, business card than him, (laughs) which is (laughs) a very legitimate, which is true. (laughs) Yeah. It's another one that I've watched and I had trouble with because I couldn't get behind the protagonist. Like I didn't, I didn't see any, any morality or anything good in him to support. What I don't like about the American Psycho is the ending because it had this feeling of was it like all a dream now or did it really happen? And then I read the book and it just, it, it still doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Right. And I, I don't like movies that have this kind of cop out. It was all a dream. Yeah. It can work, but it mostly doesn't. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, no, I agree. <laughs> Most of the time you're right. Um, the Silence of the Lambs. Uh, I haven't seen it for a long time. Um, 
what would be the connection there? I'm again guessing, you know, the pleasure in uh, violence that the the killers have in that movie. I mean, that's my guess. Oh, plus, plus Hannibal Lecter is a very educated and uh, very educated killer. Yeah. Who also enjoys classical music and good, good food and wine. <laughs> and a nice Chianti. <laughs> yes, a nice Chianti with fava beans. With fava beans. Uh, Alien. Uh, I guess the dystopian future. Um, yeah, I can't kind of figure that one out. Said, and, it, yeah. and it showed up on numerous uh, algorithms that I checked. But for some reason, it popped up numerous times. And I don't see the connection other than, I guess, being no. futuristic and, and dystopian. I honestly don't think that a lot of people who love Alien would enjoy Clockwork Orange if they don't know what, what they're getting into. Yeah. All right. And lastly, The Truman Show. Hmm. <laughs> I, that's, that's interesting. I got <laughs> nothing on that one. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We always end with the pop quiz. Four questions that are related to the uh, movie picked. Are you ready? Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you'll do well on this. All right. Okay. Number one, Alex's snake, Basil, was added to the story to add an intimidation factor to the character, but also for what reason? A uh, Because... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I get I get answers. Oh, great. Yes. Yeah, but I think you already know the answer if you want to go ahead. <laughs> uh, because Malcolm Dahl is uh, scared of, of snakes or reptiles. Yep, absolutely. And uh, Kubrick just wanted to mess with him. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> All right, number two. The sped up orgy sequence, which was actually a 28-minute single shot, was one of McDowell's favorite sequences to shoot. Why? Uh, a. Uh, because. Oh. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you, you... I think because he knew that Kubrick couldn't yell cut and that he just could go on and on and do whatever he wants. And I think then uh, Kubrick was signaling him off camera that it's, it's enough. Yep, absolutely. It's okay. that, that Kubrick, who was you know famous for multiple takes, couldn't interfere with this 20 minute, 28 minute shot that he just got to do what he wanted to do. <laughs> All right, number three, the rights to the film were exchanged several times before Kubrick acquired them and made this film. An earlier version of the film were purchased and would have starred what famous rock band? The Rolling Stones. Yeah, absolutely. See, you bought know. it for $500. Yeah. From Alex Burgess. Yeah, that's crazy. That's really crazy. Yeah. All right, and last one. I know you're going to know this one. The bodybuilder who plays Frank's aide, Julian, makes his film debut here. He would go on to achieve fame in what role? As Darth Vader. Yep, as Darth Vader. Very good. Four for four. See, you didn't have anything to worry about. <laughs> All right. So where can people find you? What do you want to promote? Um, well, my pod I'm the co-host with my friend Annie from Boston. I'm in Vienna, Austria, and our podcast is called Fresh Hell Podcast, and we cover all the murder, mystery, and macabre of history. And you can find us on pretty much every podcast platform and YouTube and on our webpage, freshhellpodcast.com. Fantastic. Well, Johanna, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, it's probably been 20 years since I watched A Clockwork Orange, so it was really nice to revisit it, and I appreciate our conversation about it. Thank you. It was a lot of fun for me. It's completely different to what we usually do talk about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean, it's also a lot of violence, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> different kind, yeah. <laughs> it's always fun to step outside of your comfort zone sometimes. Yes. So that does it for this week, but you can keep the conversation going throughout the week on social media. You can find me at Town Hess on Twitter or the show at Have Not Seen This on Twitter. On Facebook, we're at Have Not Seen This Podcast, or you can always email me at Have Not Seen This at gmail.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to the show so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes, including next week's episode, which features a story with fencing, fighting, torture, revenge, giants, monsters, chases, escapes, true love, miracles. This podcast is available on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify, or you can use the RSS feed to subscribe through whatever podcatcher you prefer. Positive ratings and reviews are always welcome, although I always appreciate it also if you just help spread the word, tell a friend, and help me build up some more listeners. And if you like World of Warcraft or other Blizzard games, be sure to check out my other podcast, Citizens of Azeroth, a World of Warcraft podcast, also available through all major podcast sources. Special thanks to Chris Talent for our wonderful theme song, and thanks to Johanna for providing this week's conversation. And maybe you have a movie you'd like to talk about, one that means something to you, or you're particularly astonished when you discover people have not seen. Come be a guest on the show. 
head over to havenotseenthis.podbean.com, click the Be a Future Guest button, submit the form there, and we'll get you set up for a future episode. Until next week, I'm Rave Telsh, and this has been Have Not Seen This. <laughs>